This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. One, bingo. It's about justice. It's about global justice. It's about perspectives on global justice. And, and the host of that show is my guest. We're doing this kind of in reverse order. I like because that. Because <laughs> Beatrice Cantelmo is a star. And we're going to reveal her as a star today. She's into uh, global justice, social justice, and she's into perspectives and Amnesty International and all the things that try to make our world right. And it isn't right. It needs help. So we talked yesterday, and you were going to watch Ai Weiwei's movie, Human Flow. So did you like it? I did. And at the same time, I also had a really hard time with it. Um, I well, think tell us what it is, to start at the well, beginning. Yeah, so um, this amazing Chinese um, movie maker. He's an artist. An artist, you know, uh, travel. And an activist. An activist. They don't like him too much yeah. in China. They, no. They tend to throw him in jail. Yeah, he was kept <coughs> uh, in captivity for 81 days, and things were really tough for him. But uh, uh, he decided to visit 23 uh, refugee camps around the globe uh, uh, to really figure out uh, what's going on, have a very first-hand uh, glimpse on what's happening in uh, the camps. But also in the process, he was able to uh, speak with the people who are directly Yeah, he somehow by. got into the camps, yeah. not all of them. You know, no. I hope you realize that yes. some of them were at a distance. True. And he had fabulous photography in any mm -hmm. event, including mm -hmm. drone shots that make your mouth water in photography. Right. Um, but but um, he got into a lot of them, and he was able to talk yeah. to the people there. Mm -hmm. that, that was interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of good social engineering that he managed to get inside these camps. Yeah. Well, not only he's an artist, but he's a shaker mover. I think also his brain as an architect is really about mm. building foundational blocks. Mm. Uh, and uh, what I really enjoyed about his work was that uh, it was very like to the core of the issues. Like, you know, like if you're thinking about 65 million people worldwide being displaced right now, either because of, you know, fear of persecution, violence, uh, climate change, he touched base on all three elements. Uh, it, Can you talk about them for a minute? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Let's just sort of yes. define our terms. Yeah. 60, I remember 60 million, but 65, that, that works. 65 million people in these mm -hmm. camps including the ones he visited uh, and maybe the ones he didn't visit, but the ones he knows about. Mm -hmm. Because the, the whole movie had like this poetic, um, you know, poetic thing that he, he read or showed on the screen mm -hmm. and he gave you the poetry of what he was trying to tell you. It was yes. very succinct yes. too. Yes. And, and to me, it was, it was not, mm, he was not trying to advocate for you know, uh, activist kind of action. Mm -hmm. He was just telling it like it was, and mostly mm -hmm. it's a very sad story. Right. So these, these refugees, I want to get a handle on that. Uh -huh. um, I remember that from the movie that a lot of them have been in these camps for decades, and a lot of them are going to stay in these, as it stands, a lot of them are going to stay in these camps for decades, for life, mm -hmm. and a lot of them have died in these camps. Mm -hmm. You don't hear about that from the kinds of diseases you get in these camps. Right. And there are cemeteries outside these camps reflecting all the people that have died over years and years of being neglected in a, in a substandard health situation, you know, with no uh, running water, no, no sewage. No sanitation. Um, it's really quite awful. No, no human dignity. No really. human dignity. Yeah. And somebody puts them in the camp. Somebody mm -hmm. enforces mm -hmm. the fence around the camp and says, you may not leave, and if you leave, we'll do bad things to you. Right. So, you know, in general, how, how have they gotten there? You say refugees. Refugees from where? Um, what's, the, what's the common denominator story mm -hmm. about how these 60 million, 65 million people uh, have accumulated? Yeah. Well, of these 65 million uh, people, human beings, we have to also remember that almost 23 million of them are children under the age of 18. Uh, 
are many of them who have never been able to well, go to been school born in the camps. and who were born in the camps and raised in the camps uh, without school without school or very minimum you know access to education and and health uh, care and uh, the basic human right dignities that uh, you and I are afforded and by the virtue of the privilege of being in a country that is not under you know a conflict that uh, jeopardizes our safety and peace right and also by the virtue of climate change where we haven't been massively impacted yet uh, we're starting to kind of get the taste of it in some regions like if you think about Puerto Rico actually today a year ago Puerto Rico was you know devastated with Hurricane Maria and uh, you know people are really struggling like there is no electricity it's off the grid for a big part of the island yeah. people died almost 3,000 people died yeah. for lack of very basic care yeah. such as clean water and the, and the United and, States did and help. precious little to help them by the way I like yeah. to add that yeah. Yeah. And uh, Trump went down there and, uh, and he threw, he threw uh, towels at oh, people, yeah. I remember that. And but the, he didn't yeah. really help them at all. But the thing is, you know, we have to actually include Puerto Ricans. It is not them, it's us. Puerto Rico is part of the United States. It's another state of the United States. And just uh, less than a month ago, Hawaii was hit with three hurricane warnings of category three to five that luckily, you know, didn't hit us. It took a detour, but we could be in the same shoes. Well, I'll tell you what that all leaves me. Um, we still have to talk about how yeah. these refugees will, yes. get, got there, but... I'm, um, I'm laying the foundation. Okay, and I want to, <laughs> you know, t take footnotes on your foundation. <laughs> but one footnote is, that, you know, I wake up in the morning and I do think about this. Uh -huh. I, I think this is, you know, maybe the finest hour for Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's wonderful to wake up and see good weather and and people who are kind and aloha yeah. around for the most part. Yeah, we got potholes and we have a rail system we probably won't complete. <laughs> well, these are small issues. Oh, yes. How about the issue of, uh, of running water? How about the issue of decent food and health care? How about the issue mm -hmm. of, of children who die prematurely? How about mm -hmm. that? And there are so many people in the world and they exist at the same time as I wake up in the morning and see the sunshine. And I feel terrible that the, the global system however it is, is permitting this to happen. And there is, there is virtually no organization, not the United Nations, not anyone not who is Amnesty. concerned about these Amnesty. refugees. Well, I think that there are concerns. What is lacking is really um, a commitment uh, that comes from all governments from all over the world and also from every single human being to look at the refugee issue you know, from a humanitarian standpoint and beyond uh, uh, the part of feeling sad and frustrated, but say, what can we do about it? The matter, you know, the fact of the matter is that this is going to only get worse. Not only because I think that in terms of uh, peace and security uh, relations, we are doing a great job, but we're not. You know, there's more conflicts, more governments that are turning into more of the right, you know, authoritarian, uh, fascist. Right. So the type number of, of people in the camps, the number of camps, are going likely to, to grow. Yeah, and not only that, but we also have to link that to global warming. Global warming is a fact. 99.7% of scientists have well, been able to determine to that. We don't that even here. need to argue that. But what that means is that resources are going to get scarcer and scarcer over time. Uh, we are going to deal with more regions in the world that are going to have drought. Um, island places like Hawaii, many islands in the Pacific are already, you know, we, we know that it's going to be a sea level rise, but there's not a plan on what do we do with environmental refugees or people who are going to be displaced because of those environmental changes. It's a whole different kind of refugee. Exactly. It's so, a climate change refugee. So, but, but nonetheless, I think that at the end of the day, you, can, you have already almost 66 million people 
who, because they have been already hit so hard and devastated, you know, with their ability to be safe, they had to flee the country to be able to survive with all they had, yeah, which we're, most of the times is like the clothes that they wear, the documents and their loved ones. But we're talking about life and death here. Yes, Because ultimately, the people in these refugee camps mm -hmm. will die for the lack of a decent life. They will be discouraged. They will not have the basics of a, of a decent mm -hmm. life in society, and they will die. And millions of them over time mm -hmm. will die. Mm -hmm. And I mean, where is the world conscious? What, what, is, what is the United Nations doing? There's, I know there's a refugee organization in the United Nations. Is it doing anything? Well, there's uh, the UNHCR. Is, I mean, I think that the issue has been so big and so uh, complex in, in terms of politics and in terms of not being able to have uh, people and government aligned to work well, together I think what to you're commit saying, to Beatrice, this. is that people don't care, perhaps, as much as they might about the lives of those individuals in the camps. Uh, those individuals are poor, downtrodden, but they're remote, removed, behind a fence. And, uh, you know, uh, we don't out know of, about them. We don't, we don't have any reminder of their problems. Out and we of don't sight, care out of them. mind is one aspect. Out of sight, out of mind. But the other aspect, too, that I see as an activist, um, and also as a human being, is the sense of overwhelm and hopelessness. Because it's such a large issue that you wonder, what can you as a person or as a group can do in your region yeah. or, or globally but, to but make that, an impact to make that shift But happening. that was the point, I think, yeah. or the, the way he left it, mm -hmm. Ai Weiwei, right. at the end of Human Flow. Yeah. It's huge, it's overwhelming, yeah. it's hard to say what we can do, um, and, and for the lack of an easy answer, we don't do anything. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, actually, Beatrice, you and me, we're not going to do anything for one minute. We're going to take a break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. And hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. Bleh kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. の日本語コミュニティハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報 ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組です。こんにちは、ハワイ。各週の月曜日2時から、ぜひ皆さん見てください。ホストの国瀬ゆかりでした。ハロー。Bingo! We're back. And I have to admit, we had a very interesting conversation during the break, as we always do. This is Beatrice Cantamo. She's the true host and the true star of Perspectives and Global Justice. No, and we're talking about one. Ai Weiwei's, you know, really hard film called Human Flow, where he shows us 65 million people in 23 plus refugee camps around the world, which the public doesn't know about and which nobody is doing much about. Mm -hmm. And these people by the millions are living and dying without food, water, any meaningful food, water, or health care in these camps. And it is a, not only a tragedy, but a statement of the immorality, you know, of governments everywhere. Um, and we, we have to remind ourselves we can do something. So the point you made during the break is climate change is going to create more refugees. Maybe you, maybe me, maybe our friends. We're going to be refugees in the same set of circumstances. Maybe this will make us as, as a community more sensitive to what happens in other refugee communities. What do you think? I think that um, that is correct. Uh, and if you really think about the history of migration in the world, and, you know, the fast migration occurred from Africa 140 million years ago. So we have to start to think about mobility as a human right. 
Pro you know, Russia. all of these refugee camps and uh, uh, walls that we are creating, it's actually quite interesting because uh, um, in 1989, before the Berlin Wall fell, I think we had about 11 walls around the world. And in 2016, it was 70. So we are creating these walls and we are creating these subhuman uh, conditions for people to well, exist uh, in refugee well. camps, but it's not going to work. It's not the solution. Camps are not designed uh, for people to live in a no. long term. Well, you know, good fences build good neighbors. Carl Sandburg, um, and he was joking. It's not true. <laughs> good fences do not build good neighbors. It was tongue in cheek, no. the whole thing. Yeah. And, and Trump's uh, Mexican wall is, is not only tongue in cheek, it's ridiculous. It but is, what I happened about the migrants coming from the Middle East and Central Asia and Africa into Europe has created a lot of these new walls. But these walls are not sustainable. They no. can't stay. They can't stay in the larger view of the species. Exactly. They can't stay. So my question for the rest of our time here on the block, if you will, okay, yes, I is will. <laughs> what can we do about it? The first step is get uncomfortable and learn. You know, one of the uh, biggest uh, tools that I think Amnesty International has is the one of education and awareness building. You know, here in Hawaii, from where I can speak from, it's been very hard to actually work with this topic. We've had some success in bringing some awareness when it came to the travel ban. You know, there was like you know, our lovely Attorney General and Judge Watson, you know, pretty much uh, said no. That's its own kind of wall. Yeah, we said build no. Lots yeah. Of walls but, with said, true, but said no, we are not going to allow for this to happen. So it kind of, you know, put a curb in that for a little bit of a year, but you know, at the end of the day, we do have a, a travel ban, you know, uh, in place. Not as bad as, um, you know, it was originally proposed, but nonetheless, it's still there. So, you know, so the part of it is like education is key because, uh, well, you know, you cannot know what nobody have taught you or, or, or talked to you about it. So there are so many layers, you know, people need to understand history. How did these countries, you know, uh, got into conflict? What is the role of um, first world nations, you know, to either support these conflicts or to make it worse? Where is our role in the United States? I think the second level of this is advocacy, and that can happen in terms of the conversations we need to have. They are very uncomfortable with our neighbors, with our co-workers, with our family members, and with our representatives. Mm. And so that comes also legislative work. So advocacy not only is about accountability and conversation time, but it's the part of asking for change. So this year in the United States, uh, um, so there was a, a conference in uh, Virginia in January where all um, chapters you know, from all over the country got together and we had a lobby day and uh, uh, you know, Hawaii was well represented. I, I came along uh, and we had uh, uh, our co-chair, Kerry Vachu, and we had the legislative coordinator. Uh, you spoke. Uh, I did. And so we went to speak with our representatives and uh, we wanted to, we had an agenda. It was very, it was very specific. We wanted uh, for our representatives in our state to advocate and to support robust funding for the support of these uh, encampments uh, in, uh, in Europe. Okay, let's take a moment now and ask, you know, how would that funding help the problem? There's 65 million yeah. people out there. If I gave you all the money you want, all the money I funded you until you were blue in the face. How would you convert that funding to resolving this problem? We were not asking for funding, you know, to support every single refugee camp, but we were asking for emergency funding to support basic needs such as clean water, medication, and uh, food. You know, many of these camps, they only the survive. Crisis, the crisis situation. It's for the crisis. It's really a bandit in a hemorrhage. 
Because if you really go into talk about uh, how you're going to uh, make a sustainable shift, you know, you have to be able to uh, have individuals actually uh, placed in different countries where they can have a chance to uh, have housing, uh, training, uh, you know, being able to get so into the workforce. How do you, how do you spend the money? I'm giving you a uh, blank check. How do you spend the money? How do you resolve the 65 million people you know, who are refugees with whatever money it takes? How do you do that? If I had that you know, magic wand and money was not a problem, I would use that money and connect with every country in the world and say, let's figure out how can we send refugees into your region of the world and with that money support his and her reintegration into society so that they can rebuild their you know, most basic needs and hopes and dreams again. Mm. That is what I would do. How do you convince the country to take people who've lived for decades in, in squalor and have no education and speak maybe one language that is not appropriate, not, not spoken in that mm -hmm. receiving, receiving country. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. I, I, like, I suggest an answer and see if you agree. Right. You have to educate them. Educate, you yes. have to make them worthy citizens of the world. Mm -hmm. They have to speak multiple languages. I'm reminded of that company I always see the ads for, Babel. Mm -hmm. You know, it's out of yeah. the Bible. It's out of the Tower of Babel where nobody spoke the same language right. and everything collapsed. But if you could make people speak languages that would en enable them to survive mm -hmm. to, in a society in another country. Mm -hmm. If you gave them skills, whatever skills uh, you know, they may need to survive and be useful and, and have a decent you know, life and purpose right. in that country, mm -hmm. then the country would be more likely to take them, and right. then the walls would come down. Right. So it's a matter of preparing them preparing, yes. for re-entry yes. into what do you want to call it, the first world or the other world? Oh, a different world. Uh, to continue this journey, you know, I think that what a lot of people forget uh, is that before these areas were hit by a massive uh, environmental, you know, political, problem or political, war, that people were actually, uh, you know, many of them were educated, mm -hmm. uh, you know, had resilient societies. And it's, not like, it's not that these skills have been forgotten, they can be transferred and they can, you know, there's more than can be done to add an additional, you know, foundation there for them to continue to move forward. Mm -hmm. I also think that, you know, other countries, host countries need to remember that there is no one pure uh, place, you know, like we all come from somewhere that you know in terms of identity like We're what, all related. Is, what is identity like okay you're an american man but how do you see yourself as an american man what is your heritage what do you bring what what, what uh, you know makes you j fidel mm. you know like so we need to remember that we need to remember our humanity and humility too uh, and i think that this movie really helped me and I think it could help a lot of viewers, you know, really re reframe the narrative that we are telling ourselves or what we are avoiding to talk about it. So what, what you know? uh, now you're associated with, you've been associated with Amnesty International mm -hmm. for a long time. What is its involvement in this issue? Well, the involvement goes in many layers. Uh, so one of the things that I talked about it was education. One of the things Amnesty is well known for and respected around the globe is our um, documentation in, in research. We go to the trenches, we really go and we map out what's going on, we talk to people, find out what's going we on. find out what's going on and we help write reports and we help validate what is going on. No, and we are bipartisan. I think one of the things that's very important is to be able to really work with both sides of the fences or multiple sides of the fences. But also to say, look, this is a human rights issue. You know, on many layers of human rights that's being, you know, really, um, you know, violated. violated. And uh, so, and these are the violations. So that, so we we share the bad news. I think the other thing that's very important that Amnesty does is that. 
we don't speak from a place of like being the experts. The people who are directly impacted by these human rights violations are the experts because they are on the front line experiencing these atrocities. And so we want to make sure that their voices are not completely silenced and that they have that platform to be able to say this is happening. So it's not just about a boring, thorough uh, research. You know, the richness of it is the stories, you know, they're like, they're devastating. But that the people are telling what is going on with them in different parts of the world. Mm. And what is, you know, what prompted them to live and how they're living now, what their hopes are. And how also I think Amnesty makes a big difference is that this is an organization that is grassroots, grassroots based. We have over six million uh, uh, members worldwide. Right? People like you and me. I don't get paid to do this work. This is no, completely no. on a volunteer. They do have some staff that are paid, but I think that people get ticked with it because they see that it's like, look, it, it is the power of many that can well, make it a difference. Is, but you've got to actually activate them in a yeah. time when there is not a lot of clarity in the world. There no. are so there's so much noise, right. so many competing right. issues, and everybody wants our attention. All these things, but you see, and this doesn't yeah. necessarily rise to the top. Yeah, you know? but uh, I think gradually it's going to. It's inevitable, uh, and it is an issue of survival. Well, it's going to get worse you know, because it's going to get worse. Yeah. So either we work together or we perish together. And I think the other part of amnesty that, I, you know, to me is still uh, very attractive and I do see it when it works, how it works as a charm, is when you get, you know, uh, education awareness, research and advocacy working together to put pressure at legislative level, not only locally, but also globally. So one of the things that we have been addressing uh, in the United States with regards to refugee issues and didn't go m very far this year with regards to how many refugees we could take uh, as a nation. On the United States? Yeah, because oh, it's, a, it's a shame just this we, week. We, we, yeah, like we turn our backs on them. We went from 140, you know, 1,000 to like half of it, oh, which tragic. is what this government, yeah. you know, administration wants. But we are the country that has the number one economy in the world, and I can't believe the countries they are much no, smaller with much less resources but so, but but we are there and but, well, i think it's the issue of having grit and perseverance and and, and wait, continue wait till the midterms and maybe the next yeah. the presidential election so, so let me let me ask you this we only have time for one more question okay. this is my <laughs> <laughs> you, you, before we started the show yeah. before we came on the air right uh, you were saying that or maybe it was after we came on the air you were saying you had trouble with the movie, mm -hmm. that there was something about it that troubled you. Yes. Can you articulate your trouble with it and give us your your thought about it? Where does it fit in the firmament of this, you know, international conversation? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this this question of global justice. Right. Well, the trouble to me um, was sitting sitting for two and a half hours watching suffering at the most extreme level as a human being and uh, seeing how normalized this is becoming and uh, also it, it, yeah normalized a new normal it's a new normal another bad yeah. new normal yeah. I, uh, that really you know tears me apart and i think part of the problem for me is uh, seeing you don't you don't have to have refugees to see the similar things happening in your own community. Look at our houseless situation here in Hawaii and across the country, you know. And so I think that the trouble for me was seeing that and to see how unnecessary suffering, you know, people have to go through and the reminder, you know, of how human rights are so important and the discomfort of actually having the privilege of having these human rights intact in my life mm -hmm. by the virtue of opportunities that people didn't have 
and the unfairness of it. So and wanting to do something and not being able to yet, you know? Yeah, just what I get out of that, what I get out of this whole discussion is that morality, humanity, care and concern about our brothers and sisters, um, global justice, if you will, doesn't come automatically. No. It doesn't come by itself. You have to work for it. You have to work for it inside. You have to right. work for it outside. You have to work for it in your community. You have to work for it in a larger community. And I, and I commend you and admire you for working for it in every way you do. Thank you so well, thank much. Thank you, my dear. Kisses, Beatrice. <laughs> I love you. <laughs>